everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Phil at the Movies, where I give you my philosophy on some of the latest films and, frankly, cinema as a whole. You're listening today to episode number 128, and this is a special episode. Well, frankly, all the episodes here are special, but this one in particular is a return of the ranking episode format. We've done a number of those on the show, and Given today is Friday the 13th, so watch out for your, your black cats and uh, don't open umbrellas indoors and uh, certainly stay the hell away from Camp Crystal Lake. Uh, that's right, folks. You probably guessed it today. We're going to be ranking the films in the Friday the 13th series, all 11 of these films. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, did I miss one? Well, we'll clarify that in just a little bit. Uh, but first off, I am delighted to be welcoming first-time guest to the show, Mr. Jay Skipworth. He is the host of the Film Strip podcast, a show that I highly recommend you give a follow and listen to because they do absolutely fe uh, phenomenal work over there uh, talking about not only current films, but certainly a wide array of movies across the genres and decades. Uh, Jay, welcome. Feel free to do a plug for your show. I may have uh, you know, stepped on it a little bit, but uh, feel free. Uh, let, let us know uh, where people can find you and, of course, what your show is uh, is about. Well, first, Phil, thanks so much for having me here. Big fan of yours and the work that you're doing. Congrats on 128 episodes. That is phenomenal. I know what it takes to do one of these shows. Uh, having uh, been a part of film strip for a good long while now and i uh, really appreciate the uh, kind introduction that you've given us and the, and the plug for the show film strip podcast uh, available on all of your favorite podcast forms and uh, you can find us on social media at film strip pod and uh, there you'll find a link to our link tree which is pretty much just a link to all the social media and the places you can find the show but We've had the show now for 14 plus years and uh, going strong. A lot of different hosts through the years. I'm very blessed to have a great cadre of friends that have been co-hosts with me for a number of time. Uh, you know, kind of the full-time co-hosts now are Ron and Lindsay, uh, my, my partners in crime, but a lot of the former co-hosts do swing back through from time to time when there's, you know, something they're really excited about. A good example, my buddy Nick, uh, who has been on the show, you know, for gosh, I guess 12 of those years uh, <laughs> at least. And uh, he, you know, he and I just reviewed the latest Alien film because that was one of his very first series with us. That's a big one for him nice. and um, had a lot of fun with that. But yeah, um, you know, we've, we've done a little bit of everything at one time or another, including the Friday the 13th movies and uh yeah back in 2016 we had a um every october we do something called shocktober uh which is the most not original way of talking about your horror series during october but we've reviewed a lot of the big franchises and one year i got it in my craw to hey we should have friday the 13th versus nightmare on elm street and culminate in the movie we're not going to talk about tonight freddy versus jason so i had ron and i doing friday the 13th and my buddy brian who really started the show with me and did the art of slaying the buffy show uh, for all those years together um doing nightmare on elm street because that's more his jam and so we did you know several fridays and then we caught up where they were kind of going twice a week we'd have a friday but we have a nightmare movie and a friday movie the nightmare movie and a friday movie until we got to freddie versus jason we did the remakes and then kind of backed up and did the the freddie versus jason uh, moment but uh, all that's back in the archives along with all the other episodes we've done and um yeah we just have a lot of fun with it man it's at this point it's just become a, a something we'd like to do it's a good chance to bring on a lot of our pod friends and you've been a a, a uh, part of that we did the, the change my movie mind uh, show right. with uh, our buddy anthony from tis the podcast and dc unlimited and all the gosh i feel like that guy's on like a thousand podcasts now but uh <laughs> anthony's like a podcast all-star but uh yeah so we, we have a good time with it and um you know we used to be real big into the big franchise we'll do end to end on one thing and then my buddy kurt and i did like all the stanley kubrick films over i think three or four years it took us to you know get through all of those and stuff and nowadays and we tend to just jump in and do stuff that we like or that a friend likes to do one of our co-hosts something like that and uh, we have a lot of good time with it so i really appreciate you letting me come on the show and plug the show and and looking forward to talking about this because uh yeah this is uh this is an interesting franchise for me and we can get into that as we go Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, again, feel free to, you know, sound off with any uh, thoughts on, on the series. Certainly there are 
a lot of takes when it comes to it. And if you're listening to this show, certainly if you're watching it on YouTube, you can see what's going on behind me. But uh, if you are if you are listening to this episode, uh, my, uh, my my cat actually has entered the podcast. So, uh, you know, yes. th- this wasn't this, this wasn't planned. Everybody, you know, he happens to be a black cat. So, you know, we're really, really getting into the Friday the 13th uh, <laughs> references here. Again, all 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 for the love I, of movies, as I like to say. Yeah, you said Friday the 13th and I'm looking at him going like it's a suffering like a tash. It's Sylvester back there, man. <laughs> Man, that's my favorite Looney Tunes. So I, I'm down for that. And See, there you go. My, my neighbors here have a, a Hemingway cat that's oh, colored, okay. very similar to, to yours there. So it kind of thought, oh gosh, do you have one of those? But, yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, Louis made his first appearance on the show. I can mark that down. So this is this is an episode for first. Yeah, I think one of my favorite my, my screensaver or, or screenshot for Ron on my phone has forever been this picture of one time he was on the show and one of his cats just jumped on his shoulder and he called it the shoulder mounted rocket cat. And <laughs> I just have kept that for all these years because it's like, still the, the picture of him I remember the most. But it's always that unplanned stuff, you know. That's <laughs> oh yeah, that's what makes it the best. So. You gotta you gotta love it. Uh, mm-hmm. So, like I said, everybody, we're gonna we're gonna go through all eleven films, and, and as we sort of teased at the start, uh, we will not be talking about Freddy versus Jason, and that was uh, by design. So, again, don't don't come at us with the virtual pitchforks and whatnot. Uh, we 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 felt that that film, while Jason is a part of it, it really is more of a Freddy film, and Jason kind of guest stars, if you will. Now. If you have a difference of opinion, I'm delighted to hear it. But, uh, you know, we, we felt for the sake of this list, we wanted to focus on where Jason is either the primary antagonist or certainly the reason for the season, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is that's a little bit of the housekeeping and the ground rules. Um, you know, I, I will say, like, I am not the biggest fan of, of this series uh by any stretch of the imagination. Anybody who knows uh, knows me and listens to this show certainly knows that um you know Halloween takes the top prize and and you know for me Michael Myers is still the king but I can appreciate these films uh more so as time has gone on uh in a lot of ways because they were directly inspired by Halloween but also they they never pretend to be something that they're not and a lot of the sort of slashers that followed after Halloween and even Friday try to be intentionally clever or unnecessarily convoluted. And with a Friday the 13th film, what you see is what you get. And and sometimes that's a perfect formula and mm-hmm. they really have perfected it. Uh, and it's kind of a shame that the series has gone dormant for a number of years. But actually, as we are recording this, there is talk of the revival of the Crystal Lake TV series uh, to be produced uh, still with A24 films, but it's going to involve now the showrunners from the soon to be released Welcome to Dairy show, uh, which of course is uh, from uh, Stephen King's uh, It character and all those uh, wonderful connections. So uh, if you're a fan of that, maybe this may be a good uh, return for Jason, but I'm I- I'm suspecting there will still be a lot of gray area because there's the whole legal issues with this series which we can certainly get into uh during the discussion because it it has had a legal nightmare uh for the longest time yeah absolutely i mean i i can only think of one of the series that had the legal entanglements that went on as long as this one have done and that's the james bond series and yeah the, the broccolis versus kevin mcclory yeah. all those years now you know the difference is bond just kept putting movies out uh for for decades and decades but you know they finally did get mcclory won enough to finally get his version of thunderball out there which i you know i have a lot of <laughs> thoughts about james bond movies too but uh yeah, I I'm with you though, Phil. Like when it comes to like slashers and stuff, and you know, in my age, like you you had to pick one on the playground or whatever, I guess. <laughs> and I and my gateway into all of it was Halloween, and I I kind of always go back to that. You know, it's just, it's just one that it's a series that, as has been said a lot of times, it has a choose your own adventure flavor to it. You can kind of pick a lot of different lanes to go down, yeah. uh, and I'm I'm fine with that. I'm okay with that. I I have a good time with that series and. You know, I can sit here and tell you that there are better films in the series than others. In fact, there are competent films in the series and not so much, you know, in, a, in that one. But I have fun with all of them and I yeah. like them. Friday the 13th was always the, I don't know, kind of the knockoff cartoon version of Halloween in a lot of ways. But yeah. it spoke to me because I was a Boy Scout 
growing up and growing up oh, there you go doing a lot of camping and out in the woods and all of that stuff i you know felt a kinship to some of this because i spent some time in those kind of settings and stuff sure. and i mean to give you a sense for that like my parents used to use cinema as a way to teach us lots of things my dad showed me deliverance before i went on my first canoe trip you know as a way to like don't <laughs> don't veer off it's a hell of a way to doing that uh he wow. they, my, my parents showed both of us fatal attraction as a hey don't cheat um <laughs> that worked so <laughs> So, yeah, so I've, I've had that kind of, you know, cinematic experience in terms of informing you know, who I am and my personality and stuff through the years. But Friday was one of those that I got to after Halloween and, um, sure. you know, and I remember and I'll talk about it as we go through them, what order I saw them. In, and it was many years later and when I finally went, you know, soup to nuts on them and, uh, right. and you know, kind of and it was before the remake happened. That was the really the last entry we've had in the series. But um, I yeah, it took me a long time to get around to doing that. But it was also a series I felt like you could just pop in and out of. You didn't have to keep up with as much. You know, Halloween yeah. requires a little bit of homework sometimes. Right. Right. And, and this one, not so much. And even, you know, Freddie, in some ways, like they're they're all very knitted together, except the second one seems to be the offshoot. But the right. primary six of them, is, they're pretty tight, you know. And yeah. So if you miss one, you might not know exactly what's happening. Right. And, and I appreciate that in a, in a series. I think the only other modern series I feel like has done that that well um, is like Saw. Um, and it's oh, got. Yeah. It's gotten pretty convoluted itself, but um, yeah. my, my wife and I joke that, you know, a, a couple of our first movie dates were we saw the Zack Snyder remake of Dawn of the Dead, which we both really enjoyed. And yeah. then we saw the first Saw movie. And we've, we, I think we saw like six of them together in a row in, in theaters before I think she finally bailed on it and I'm yeah. not up with it, but uh, you know, do, do watch those from time to time. But yeah, Friday as a series um, was never my favorite, but it wasn't something I just hated either. No. So yeah, again, I, I, I they don't require more, a lot, so they're kind of fun. Yeah, I have probably stronger feelings towards toward yeah towards Freddy, but yeah, that that's for another. Yeah, not not in a good way necessarily, but then we'll save that for another episode. Fair. <laughs> I'll get I'll get into you know my issues with that, but um, I, I love the first one, and that's 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 kind of what matters. But um, all right, so we'll uh, we 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 can uh, venture back to Camp Crystal Lake and uh, talk about this this uh interesting and and frankly creative series that uh while i said it has gone dormant for a few years uh i do suspect because of the era that we are in right now with horror continuing to be a mainstay at the movies and and frankly it always has been but certainly now we're really seeing the kind of the fruits of all of that come to uh come to fruition but i i suspect we will see some form or another of, of jason's return sooner rather than later but uh that's again for for another discussion later on but uh all right jay since you are the guest on the show i would like you to go first with your uh, uh with your number one or i guess this would be your number 11 and we'll work our way down to uh to number one sure sure and i, I want to be clear I, I like all of these in some way or another and i respect the fact that movies are hard to make and people that you know, do them obviously put a lot into them or whatever so i'm not banging on anybody's you know hard work and stuff there's just some things i tend to prefer more than others so from from the top and the one i prefer the least of all of these and by that i mean phil it's one that i never go out of my way to watch unless i have a reason to for some way and that is jason goes to hell the final friday uh that one comes in at number 11 for me and it's it's disappointing in the respect that I feel like it's got an incredibly interesting setup and the start of it, because at that point in the series, Jason Voorhees is the most prolific violent serial killer in American history. And what would the American response to that be? We would blow him the hell up. That's exactly right. And so I responded to that like, oh yeah, that's exactly what we would do when I first saw this. And I didn't see this in theaters. I saw it on video right when it came out and I think my brother even rented it because he probably saw it in theaters. He's a little bit older than me. And I remember watching the first 15 minutes of it and go like, oh, this is, wow, I didn't expect that. That's cool. And then when they got into the body jumping situation and when you take Jason out of the Jason series, and I, I mean that in the, you know, Friday the 13th has moments when Jason's not the, the character, but when he's the focus and you decide to take him out of it and give it to other people, 
it just doesn't work for me at least. And I felt like they had an interesting idea, but didn't pay it off completely. Like it's one of those, let's tell this really difficult, you know, convoluted backstory to this rather simple character and then but not really tell it and make it about four of the things at the same time. So it feels like these six perfunctory plot lines going at the same time. And by the time it gets around to resolving itself in the end, which is pretty satisfying in terms of a, an ending would be, or if you're going to call it final, which is that's a joke in this series a lot. But if we're ever going to do that, it's not a bad resolve, but gosh, by the time we get there, it's such a slog for me to get through. I just have a hard time with it. And then the cheat at the end, and taking 10 years to ever pay any of that off. It's like, eh, I, I have a hard time with this one. So, so Jason goes to hell. The final Friday is my number 11. I'm with you on that. It's my number 11 as well. And it's, it's a situation where there's a, there's a unique movie in there somewhere. I think if they had followed with the thread line of the U S government is going after Jason and just stuck with that, I think you could have made a unique film. And you could have justified 90 minutes or so. Once you start getting into, like you said, body jumping, it's basically ghost Jason. You've lost the, the plot. I mean, these movies are, are bare bones to begin with. And when you try to start adding all of these sort of extra layers and, well, he can go from this person to this. I mean, it's like, okay, what are we doing here? Is this is this a possession movie? Is it a, a zombie movie? Is it J like, what, what the hell's going on here? I mean, Jason goes to hell. Fine. Go to hell. I don't care anymore. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's yes. You get the spoiler alert, the, the Freddy moment at the end with the glove coming up and pulling the mask, which is, is, I mean, that, that's a, that's a fun little like nod Easter egg moment, but like, does it save the film for me? No, it's sort of just, Oh, that's, that's clever. Like, We'll see, we'll see the results of it in 10, 11 years. Uh, and even then, it's it's not even really connected. But that's, again, a whole other, that's another issue. Yeah, this is just, to me, it, it it's right there in the title, The Final Friday. They they really reached the bottom of the barrel. And, and it feels like they had been really scraping for a long time. And this was sort of like, ah, eh, just throw it see if it sticks and what ha what have you and i i don't have it in front of me but this i think might have been one of the lowest grossing entries in the series i i might have it off with one or uh, or another but it, needless to say it was not a a box office hit uh to say the very least but yeah this one really feels like a wasted opportunity for me this is one of two wasted opportunities with this series and and i'll I'll, I'll I'll keep my powder dry for for that thought in in a minute. No, I think you're right. It's it's worth noting this was the first post Paramount uh, Friday the Thirteenth. This was the one New Line got, and they were trying to make Freddy versus Jason, and they just couldn't get their stuff together to make it work. And it it took a long time for them to ever really get it up the snuff and, and make it happen. And you're not wrong. It's one of the, the lower grossing ones in the, the series. It only made about right under $16 million when it was all said and done. And now I made it back on home video. So that sure. doesn't account for that. Yeah. And it was only a $3 million movie. So that's the thing about these movies is that they never cost a lot of money to make and they turn profit like mad they print money <laughs> yeah they they were they were paramount's way to print money and i mean and new line that was the house freddie built you know right. you don't have that's right the lord of the Rings series and freddie doesn't fund it all the years before that's i heard no. you there <laughs> yeah so i mean it really it really works that way and but this one we agree it's just too convoluted by the time it gets around to what it wants to do and it was a matter of we've got to make a movie or we're going to lose the rights Bingo. and unlike other series <clears throat> cough hellraiser cough they didn't just <laughs> want to slap something together so i give them credit for trying yeah. but it it still doesn't really land much for me so yeah it's not not a not a movie i'm i'm again ever really right to go back and just revisit yeah no this this is sort of almost a a one and done. And I, I, I honestly think this, this has been a, a one time from beginning to end. And then I've either walked into like parts of it or, you know, I've seen, you know, clips over the years, but yeah, th mm -hmm. this was like, you know, I don't need to return to it. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not one I go back to often either. 
All right, so we're both in agreement on number eleven. Uh, so we're all actually off to a very good start. Uh, um, what is uh, what is number ten for you? So number ten, and I want to be clear about this. This ranks at number ten only because I feel like it's at a point in this series when it, it it's just where it naturally should live anyway. That should tip it off. But it's Jason X, um, and I want to say very clearly, I, I remember when this came out, Phil. I had just really started into the bulk of what my career is now. So I had moved to this small town. There was nothing to do there. There literally was nothing to do. And I had no idea there was a new Jason movie even happening or had happened. I wandered through the local video store uh, and it was not a chain. It was like local. And I walked by and I saw the box and I said, you got to be kidding me. They made another Friday the 13th movie. Cause at that point I'd seen all of them. I'd seen the whole, the whole lot of them. And I thought, well, I got to see it, you know? So I rented it, took it home that Friday night. And I just laughed and had such a good time. And I was like, okay, we have gone so far from the plot of what these movies are. All right. But if you're going to do that, you can do that and get off into some really nasty places or some dark, not fun places, or you can just lean into the joke. And by that point, I think I had discovered like Leprechaun films and had always liked the Critters films. And so I felt like this was Jason in that world a little bit. And, you know, it's honestly up until they do the Uber Jason, the super upgraded one that I am totally on board with the movie. I, I like all of it. I'm having a blast with it. It's when they upgrade him too much. And then we get the cyborg Terminatrix shooting at him. And I'm like, that's where it kind of crosses a barrier for me. So it's one of those that if it's on like sci-fi or something one afternoon or, you know, running on AMC during fear fest or whatever, I might leave it on in the background. It, I don't hate it. But I don't love it the way I like some of the other ones in this series. So it comes in at number 10 for me. And that just feels like the perfect spot anyway, because it is Jason X. That's that's perfectly said. Uh, my, mine's uh, not far off on that one. But uh, yeah, I I do agree with you. It is it is one of those films where it does lean into the almost the campiness that sometimes is associated with this series. And it really does go just wild which i mean i I had to i have to give them again points for just the creative out of the box thinking because i mean jason x is is that it it is probably the most i mean it probably is the most inventive entry in the series uh and certainly is kind of of the of its time you sort of mentioned you mentioned critters and um certainly the leprechaun films it definitely has that that vibe with it, which, uh, you know, again, nothing wrong with that, but it certainly, you know, it is a, a a time capsule to, uh, sort of that, you know, sort of late eighties, early nineties, uh, horror where, where a lot of these, uh, these type of characters were trying to figure out what the hell they were doing with themselves. Yeah. You really uh, gotta go to space. That's the, yeah, no, the joke. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> go to space. That's, you know, why not, you know, why at this point, yeah. um, so for me, number 10 is Friday the 13th, The New Blood. And th- this is one where, again, I, I think there is a a story there. It's it's a unique entry, but it feels like basically Jason versus Carrie. And, you know, again, not that I'm necessarily opposed to sort of introducing, you know, that kind of. Uh, telepathic connections with with these killers certainly halloween five is a i mean i wouldn't even call it a guilty pleasure i i love that 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 entry even though it has a lot of problems with it and certainly has the you know the the telepathic connection between jamie and michael running on without really any explanation in the film i don't know for, for some reason this just felt like all right we're gonna have to find a way to keep the storyline going so let's take parts of what we like from carrie let's just combine it with a friday the 13th film and see what happens and again it's by no means the worst entry but it's it's not particularly good either it's just it's just sort of there it's there and again i I think for me it's sort of the combination of jason meets carrie where you know jason kind of already has that all right is he dead is he a zombie like what? Well, what's his deal kind of a thing and now you're going to go and you know basically you know re- recreate elements from carrie to like 
you know, pit them against each other. Like, I, I don't know. It just seemed a little, a little silly and, and over the top. Whereas, you know, again, I mean, I'm probably showing my bias with Halloween, but like, I could at least kind of buy the whole niece, uncle, telepathic connection that again was never explained and then just sort of went away as the movie went on. But like, I don't know, it just felt more organic. And maybe that again, just the way the Halloween series sometimes just sort of, you know, picked up the thread from a previous film and it's like, all right, let's just go in this direction. This just kind of felt like it was really out of left field and was just like, well, people like Carrie. So let's try to inject those elements into a Friday film. We're not far off on where we have that one in rankings. I'll kind of reserve some of my thoughts okay, until, yeah. until we get a little closer, but I don't disagree with anything you said. And, um, I think you make a great comparison saying that it's not all that different than when Halloween tried to go a little more supernatural and stuff, though. I I think there's a little more basis. I'll just say this real quick about Halloween five. It is the one in the series still that if I watch in a dark room, something about it absolutely unnerves me. There's there's some quiet, scary stuff with the way that score is done and just the, the one thing that Dominic I think Gerard did was restore the quiet yeah. stalking of Michael uh, again, which I like. So, yeah. So we, we're in agreement. Halloween five is not even a guilty pleasure. It's just a pleasure. Yeah, so, that's right. Um, yeah. So I enjoyed that, but yeah, I'll, I'll hold my thoughts on, on uh, new blood till I get to it in ranking. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So uh, what, uh, this would be, uh, this would be number nine then. Number nine. You. What would be, uh, what is, what is your ninth ranking in this, uh, a steam series well it's friday the 13th a new beginning and okay a uh i put it in this spot because if i'm gonna ding jason goes to hell for taking jason out of the series i i certainly have to do this though that said for what it is the fifth entry in a series after a very demonstrative chapter we'll we'll say from chapter four it's a it's an interesting direction to go in and it also lends to a pet theory i have about friday the 13th movies which i'll hold until a little bit later but i remember seeing this one when it like jumped onto showtime or whatever one of those times we had that growing up or hbo whichever one and i remember even at the time as a kid um thinking man this one's kind of (laughs) nasty And it is, and you know, pointing out later, it was directed by a porn director and, you know, the directive of just like a porn every 10 minutes, something needs to be happening um, and all of that. <laughs> it's one of the most violent in the series, though. And I think mm-hmm. one of the things that I've enjoyed watching as, you know, as movie Twitter does, it will we'll grab something, we'll get sucked into the vortex and we'll get into the re- re-evaluation vortex, right? And in the last few years, I've seen more and more people go, you know, it's not that awful. Like it's, it's dumb and it's kind of cheap, but there's some fun stuff to be had in it. And it's, it's a Roy movie. It's not Jason, but you know, there's Roy fans out there. And uh, I, I don't know. I happen to, to like it for its campiness. It's the other thing is that it goes down real easy. It's, it's a short one. Um, and it made money. I mean, people were curious. They wanted to go. I, I have a friend in podcasting that used to dub this Friday the 13th, the wrong direction. And, you know, he's not <laughs> wrong <laughs> in that assessment, but there's just something about it that I keep going, you know, every now and then to go back to. And if it's again, if it's on and one of those marathons or whatever, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I might pop in and watch a few minutes of that one. So I've got new beginning in at, at my, my next spot there at number nine, but uh, not a hated film in my lexicon. No, that's fair. That's fair. I'll, I'll I'll hold my thoughts on that because that actually, Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, it's, it's a little further down the line, but uh, number nine for me is uh, just shy of the 10th spot. It is Jason X. And I, I'll co-sign everything that you said. Again, this is, you know, much in the same way as, uh, you know, a film like new blood. It's like, all right, let's put Jason in space. That makes a lot of sense. Let's sort of combine Terminator elements. I mean, it's, it, it's a wild campy film. Uh, it, it definitely, it, what I said earlier about these films don't try to be more 
than than they are on paper. This is a classic case of that. You know, you've basically got a futuristic setting and you've got Jason Voorhees there. I mean, it, again, logic goes out the window uh, right at the right at the start of this film. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you when they do the the upgrade, you know, Uber Jason. That's where it's a little. It, it, I mean, you're always sort of straining credibility with these films, but that was kind of almost a bridge too far. And like I said, it's not a deal breaker, but it's a it, it's definitely a it's a choice, shall we say? But you know, it's sort of just a a fun, you know, if it's on in the background, I'll I'll keep it on type of a thing. It, yeah, this is one of those Friday films where you just, it, it is what it is. And I respect them for taking some risk with the series. And that is definitely something that you have to say that not every uh, franchise uh, of you know, the uh, the 80 slashers necessarily did they, they they were willing to take a lot of risk and and bold decisions with Jason and again this is just one of many that occurred over the uh the length of the franchise yeah well said well said okay so moving right along to uh to number eight number eight I've got Friday the 13th part seven and the new blood uh okay in, in that uh in that spot um i i hear you when you say carrie and mm -hmm. versus jason and i think that's fair but i've always read this to have a lot of fire starter versus jason with a little bit of evil dead underneath oh, that's, it. that's a good point that's a good and, point and i'll come back to my evil dead things i think it plays into something later um in, in a bit but i liked um I, this is the introduction of kane hotter so i feel like we right. we established jason as this He's a complete monster at this point. He's the makeup effects in this are great because he's just dripping goo and ooze, and you see all the bones and the face and you know, all the all the goofy stuff. I feel like Laura Park Lincoln is pretty good as Tina. Everybody else in this movie, including Terry Kaiser, is mostly awful. But it introduces something that we hadn't had up to that point in the series, and that was it was time to start rooting for Jason to kill all of these people because these were now going to be the archetypes of everyone you hated in high school, <laughs> and for one reason. Or another and i didn't think we had that at, at, up until this point which is pretty good to get seven entries in and you haven't done that yet you haven't turned you know it took freddie like three or four and then no we're rooting for freddie <laughs> like that's that's pretty much how that goes um and i i don't know i i there's something about this one that I do feel like buried inside of it is a great lean, probably one hour and 19 minute movie. It's got a little chaff on it, but particularly the ending of it and the resolve, I I've never heard him say it, but I feel like Fanny Alvarez likes it a lot. Cause if you watch his evil dead remake in 2013, the end of that, owes a lot to this. I mean, it plays very similar. So Again, I, I feel like it owes as much to Firestarter as it does mm. Carrie. If we're going to bring Stephen King into it, and again, I have I just have a good time with it. I think it's a it's a pretty easy watch. The parts of it that you get bored with and you hate, well, you can just skip and ignore. Like they, you right. don't eat them anyway. It's not like you're going to miss something, and you just come back and and pick up when you're when you're ready. And uh, yeah, it's fun. And again, Kane Hodder again brings so much to it. And as a personal story, where my wife grew up. Uh, this film was shot in and around there. So I've seen some of the places and they don't really look anything like it, but I've heard people tell the story that, you know, became legend about Kane Hodder walking back to his trailer in full Jason garb. And he's absolutely exhausted. And this deputy who doesn't know what's going on stops him and says, what are you doing? And he said, he just didn't have the energy to carry on a conversation. So he just stared at the guy and the guy just turned around and left. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I can believe that, you know? And, and again, the, the setting of it is something that I'm like, Oh yeah, I recognize recognize some of it you know when he's traipsing right. through the woods and some of the roads i'm like i know exactly where that is so there's a little personal connection though that came in later in life for me but uh, yeah I, I don't know I, I just think it's a fun one it's not terrible and more or less goes down easy and again i feel like it does lend itself into some more modern filmmaking too that's a good point I, th that one you actually made a good point with the fire starter reference so i I may have to make a priority this year to to put this one on the rewatch list because uh yeah you you actually do raise some good points um and this one certainly has all of the uh the the character archetypes that are 
you know, certainly, you know, become legend in, in any, any type of a slasher film. Uh, you know, it, it is a recreation of, of high school's worst, uh, to say the least, but, uh, no, again, you have to, uh, have to give a shout out to Kane Hodder because this of course was, uh, this was his entry. This is, this is the man who, you know, arguably is the face of Jason Voorhees and, and, you know, in many ways, you know, cannot be replaced. I mean, certainly, you know, there are, you know, people have their, their, their picks and certainly I'm sure there will be another Jason one day, uh, probably sooner rather than later, but Kane Hodder really defines the, the, the look and the performance of a character that is totally mute. I mean, again, you're not going to get dialogue from Jason Voorhees, but that's, again, it's all in his body language and, and his movements and, uh, again, he's he's frightening in the films, but uh, from everyone who I know who has actually met him in real life, they say he's nothing but a giant teddy bear. So uh, I, I, I tend to believe that because that's usually the case with uh, all of these uh, horror icons. They're the nicest people you can uh, you, you'd ever want to meet. So I'm not I'm not at all surprised with that. But uh, no, that, that, that you raise some good points with that. So I, I may have to uh, revisit this film sooner rather than later. All right, so number eight for me, and you know this one, I, I I went back and forth on this. At one point, it was a little lower on the list in, in terms of being you know near the bottom, but uh, you know it's one of those movies where I kind of have a, a a love hate with it, and and the love definitely won out, and, and that is the uh, the famous or the infamous, depending how you look at it. Jason takes Manhattan. Uh, this is a film where if you read the script the original script if you look at some of the production uh designs and a lot of the artwork there was a totally different movie that was intended for this film they actually wanted to go and shoot it in new york at, or at the very least recreate parts of of new york iconography classic landmarks what have you for whatever reason and it's again sort of the the, the story of the friday the films there's always something that happens either a legal challenge or just money runs out or just there's no time and sadly this is a it's a film where there's a there's a wasted opportunity because i really think much in the same way scream 6 kind of wasted the new york opportunity putting a slasher villain in the city that that never sleeps i i mean come on like th that is a prime location and you should at least be trying to make something of it i i forget the run time of of jason's actually being in new york city i, I want to say it's less than 30 minutes of the film pretty much half of the movie is them on a on a i don't i won't even call it a yacht but it but sort of a, you know you know glorified pontoon boat you know making their way towards the city and they sort of end up there by accident but much of this film is is confined to a bow and it's really more of a testament to the marketing which is arguably one of the best of the later friday films because it's it's jason in new york iconography you know i love new york with the with the mask uh over the heart i mean it was really inspired and so i kind of appreciate the spirit of this film and like i said i, I would have loved to have had it be more in line and more more like okay we're gonna we're actually gonna put jason in new york and see what happens but it is what it is we get him for a few moments but the moments that the film utilizes and i don't actually think it was even shot in new york it was either on a soundstage or in other locations but it it is kind of wild and it's again one of those movies where you just sort of enjoy the the zany almost campy atmosphere of like again jason's on the subway and it, you know he's just like he's he's pushing into people there's the scene where he's supposed to be in times square and you know he knocks into a a, a couple of a uh, a uh, kids and they're like you know you know what's up with that man and turns around of course you know lifts the mask up and they go you know like wild and lose their shit over it and you know again there's moments like that and the 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 defeat or or death of Jason, if you know not that these characters ever die, mind you, but uh spoiler alert again if you haven't seen it, but it's one of the most uh memorable, I think, of all of the 
the Jason death scenes in the film where they, they literally go into the, the sewers and the tunnels and he's just sort of rotted away by, by, uh, by, by, uh, you know, it's not, not quite uh, nuclear waste, but, but sort of acid and whatnot. And it's, it, I mean, it's, you're going to take out the, the, the monster. You, you're going to do it in a spectacular way. And like, they're, you know, trying to climb to safety on the ladder. And it's, again, it's kind of a cool way to use some of the, uh, kind of urban legend aspect to, to New York City. And so that I kind of appreciated. But I mean, overall, I think it, it was a wasted opportunity that, again, there were other factors. But uh, it, it, that seems to be the, the the rule, I guess, with horror film or you know horror franchises that take place in New York because Scream 6 pretty much did the same thing where they didn't even utilize the city that much other than just for the name. But yeah, I, I enjoy this film because it's, Again, it's one of those movies where you don't take it too seriously. You just sort of have a great time with it. If you're expecting it to be kind of like a, a gritty, yeah, I remember someone said, oh, you know, I thought it would be a Martin Scorsese inspired uh, slasher film. I'm like, okay, you know, d d stop right now. <laughs> you're not going to get that. You know, this is not. Um... You know, uh, you know, taxi driver or something like that. <laughs> You're expecting way much. Out yeah, of no, I said, d d lower your expectations. Uh, but putting all that aside, I, I I have a good time with this film, and and you know, as, you know, as much as I have some issues with it, it's 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 entertaining. Yeah, and it is entertaining, and this is a great segue because this is my number seven spot is Jason Takes Manhattan, and I'll tell you why because I, when I got around to seeing this. I, I had heard like, oh, it's terrible. He's never even in New York. And at that point, I'd been to New York before, so I, I knew what it looked like. And I didn't care. I, I liked the fact that New York was sort of the treat you got in the third act. You know, it wasn't all in New York. Because I'm with you. I don't know that any slashers ever used New York properly. Scream had a chance. That subway sequence is really good. It's the only thing in the movie that I like in Scream 6. You can hear me and Anthony argue about that on, on the film strip. But I, and it's all a good fun, too. But, I, but I, yeah, I like this one because it doesn't take itself too seriously. But it's got some great kills in it. And it's got some real nasty fun in it. And it's Jason being pretty vicious too uh, in, in the movie, which is something Kane Hodder just kind of kept in, in his, his iterations as Jason, the times that he played the four times he played him and he just got tougher and tougher and tougher. And I liked the, the different people Jason had to wade through, you know, kind of getting to the final girl as it were and, and her friend in in new york and you know, you have the guitar girl you know and he kills her with that and then you have the guy that wants to box him and so he punches him and then jason gets one hit and knocks his head literally off i mean like how can you not laugh at that so the ending of this one too you know the toxic waste dump and stuff which always reminded me of you can't do that on television news which they shot it in canada so maybe they just borrowed it but when he boils down to just being a small child again it's one of those moments where you go, what the fuck is this movie doing? But you'll never forget that. And you will talk about that ending forever. It's like, uh, you know, whichever version of Curse of Michael Myers you watch at the end, you're going to go at the end of it and go, what just happened? <laughs> it's going to leave you with a lot of questions. And, you know, for a horror franchise, when you get to the eighth part, if you can leave people walking out of the theater going, what just happened? The, you know, you've done something. And, and I, again, I think as more people have watched this through the years, they've come to realize like, no, it's not great, but it is a lot of fun. And there's some real fun and there's some good comedy in it too. It's got some good timing. So I, I don't hate this one either. I like it at, at my seven spot. So we're right in line with that one. Yeah, th this is one where you re again you really have to just enjoy it for the ride. And yeah, like I said, it, it, when you get to an eighth entry, you know you're, you're either at the bottom of the barrel or quite you know almost near it. And this this proved that you know despite sometimes the the being the blunt of jokes, uh, the series still had some uh, had some fight in it. And you know again. Props to them. I mean, you get past one film, that's a plus. When you get to eight, that's that's a major accomplishment. So I again, so a real uh, soft spot for Jason Dixon. Uh, 
Um, maybe one day there will finally be a, a, a slasher that that utilizes New York to its full potential. Oh, but oh, I've I've got the one that is rife for remaking too. Can we please redo New Year's Evil, but instead of setting it in California, set it in New York? There this we go. Time? I there we I go. think that that's one that needs to be revisited. At this point, I don't know how it hasn't been. It feels like it's just built for it, but you know, um, that that would be perfect. Yeah, and we solved that right there. There you go. <laughs> yeah, cut the check. To that's right. That's right. There we go. <laughs> Story yes. by. There we go. That's all I did. Just, just a credit. That's a just give us a credit. Yep. Um. Okay. So let me see. This brings me to uh, number seven. So uh, again, this was another one where I went back and forth on, but uh, I, I think I'm comfortable where this one ended up. And this is a uh, this is the, uh, the infamous or perhaps the famous again. It sort of, you know, depends how you look at it with the series. You're either glass half full or glass half empty. Uh, but for me, it's Jason Lives. And this was uh, this was really a return to form for the series. Uh, coming coming after the 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 controversial and en- uh, entry, uh, which I will say my thoughts on that, uh, as you probably can guess, based on the, where the ranking is right now. Um, but this was the one that that sort of got the memo that the audiences wanted Jason as as the main antagonist. They didn't always get that uh memo as we as we said with uh uh with you know with the uh with the uh the uh you know the ghost hopping or you know body body jumping version of Jason. But uh you know nevertheless this was one where they're like Jason is back and we're gonna keep him as as our bad guy you know they sort of learned their lesson they they probably looked at the you know direction that halloween went when they went a sequel without michael and ultimately these franchises are built on the backs of these titular characters and you know this is one it's not a particularly in like i mean it's it's another friday film like so it's you know it kind of you know it's picking up the threads of the last film but it's when I say it's a return to form, it very much feels like the the, the original four entries in a lot of ways. It's very uh, low budget isn't the isn't the right terminology, but it has that sort of gritty, almost uh, independent minded feel that the earlier films had, and I'm sure that was probably a, a conscious decision that they really wanted to go back to the drawing board and and bring jason uh you know kind of back to his original settings it's again the story it's it's sort of flimsy but for me i remember you know because i had sort of watched the previous entry and then saw okay well how are they gonna what are they gonna do with jason what's what's happening now and, and i just remember sort of the impression this left to me of like i really didn't care necessarily about the story i i you know it was like the story kind of went over your head like you were just remembering the imagery and just like, you know, Jason being resurrected and kind of, you know, showing everybody, you know, I'm back, so to speak, that was very impactful. And I remember saying, okay, Friday's got its, it's got its juice back uh, again. So I, I, you know, again, this is, there are definitely better entries uh, in the series. Again, we're getting to the point with the listing where or the ranking, we're going to really start uh, unpacking it a little bit more, but this is one that, I I definitely hold up as like if you're going to reintroduce your your villain after you've done something deeply controversial that the fans don't like, this is the way to do it. And it's again, it's a return to form. It's it's very thrilling. And again, it, it's it's right there in the title. Jason lives. I uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I'll hold my thoughts until it appears in my list. And all right, that's fair. So, that's yeah. fair. All right, yeah. perfect. Very good. So, in the sixth spot for me is Friday the Thirteenth Part Three or Three D. Now, I've never had the pleasure of seeing this in three D, <laughs> but this one falls in there for me because while I still like it, I think it it's in a spot lower than my top five ones. And I'll, I'll try to explain why as I get through them here, but I do think it's got, I mean, 
it deserves this spot in my list because it gives us some iconography that changes Jason forever. We get the hockey mask. We get the multiple ways of killing people that starts in this one. Because <laughs> before he's just stabbing people most of the time. You know, he may throw one person here and there, but he's just in this one, man, we're harpooning folk. We're throwing folk. We're doing all kinds of things. We've also got this completely unnecessary days of our lives flashback story in it. But it's told like Dana Kimmel gives an incredible Phoebe Cates impression from Gremlins in this. I don't know that it's intentional, but it feels like it was because it's very much the same speech of, that Phoebe Cates gives about her dad and Santa Claus in Gremlins. And it also has what has to be in my mind, Phil, in a slasher dumb, the greatest horror movie girlfriend of all time. And I'm talking about Debbie Klein played by Tracy Savage, the incredible newscaster, by the way, who has never shot away from the fact that she did this movie. But let me just lay out my case for Debbie here. <clears throat> One, she's pregnant, but she doesn't act sick all the time. She doesn't care that her boyfriend is kind of goofy and sort of a circus clown in training. She must have sex all the time. She likes all of his goofy friends. She's into horror stuff. She's reading Fangoria when she gets killed on a hammock that she just had sex on. She, and she's she's just goofy she's just fun she's just i mean she may be the pretty girl but she's also a nerd and that's what she kind of love about her and i'm like man debbie's like the greatest horror movie girlfriend ever and she gets killed in a horrific horrific way it's it's the callback to the kevin bacon kill of the first one but done with even more money and more blood and i don't know man i i just like all everything about this movie in terms of just as an easy watch and i love the the goofy motorcycle gang that doesn't belong in town I like the annoying Shelly, uh, who's a great entertainment lawyer. Thank you, Larry Zerner. You're part of the reason that that we got SAG Act to you know to 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 get back into the room and do some some good negotiating. Uh, I, I like all of it, and I love the fact that in the end, Chris Dana's Dana Kimmel's character gets that axe and hits him right in the friggin' forehead with it, man. And we leave the movie with him laying on a bale of hay not twitching not moving and it just cuts at that the right moment and i'm like yeah this is cool and i've actually heard christopher nolan say i mean i like movies that just make you drop right that he said you know inception comes from a, the end of inception comes from lots of places that's one of them and i'm like man no one's one of us y'all he likes fast and furious movies and he likes friday the 13th movies and i i appreciate that about this one because if you want it to have an ending, you got an ending, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and if yeah. you don't want it to, it leaves you with a great scare. Plus, man, that Jason Disco-esque <laughs> soundtrack in this, it's right at that cusp of when the 80s really took over, but the 70s were still lingering on. It's just it's just kitschy fun. So I, I've got Friday the 13th 3 in my number six spot. All right. Well, I I will hold my thoughts because uh, three three is coming up a little bit, Jay. But uh, I, I I'm I'm with you. I'll just I'll tease that out. Uh, number number six for me is uh is the infamous part five, a new beginning, and you know this as I said was a controversial entry at the time because it it essentially is a a remake of the first film but instead of it being again spoiler alert if you haven't seen the film that that that, that goes without saying at this point if, if we're talking about it you know they're going to be spoilers but i always feel the need to put the disclaimer um instead of the the mother it's a father in this time and, and again this is not everybody's cup of tea because jason isn't in the film and that's again this is one of those situations where I would love to know what the reactions were when this film first came out, because certainly today, if a movie like this was being made, I think people would be more in the know. I sort of point to Halloween ends in a way as sort of a a spiritual successor to uh, to part five. And maybe that's why I have a soft spot for this entry, because I'm a big fan of, of uh, of another infamous uh, horror entry Halloween ends. But again, we'll save that for another episode, I'm sure. But this is one of those movies where I really appreciated what they were going for. And it's something that I actually wish Halloween would have done vis-a-vis -vis Jamie 
at the end of part four, which was gone in the direction of, okay, now we have a new killer. And obviously they got Jason back. You know, Michael you know, didn't take a break from part four to part five, but I, I like that they went in that direction. And like I said, it, it is essentially a soft remake of the first film, because like I said, you have a father who is now taking on the Mrs. Voorhees type role. Uh, but it's, again, it's sort of, keeping all of the the tropes and the trappings that we have come to associate with this series since part two. And I, I just sort of applaud it for being bold enough to say, yep, no, Jason died. He's dead at the end of part four. We're moving on and going to try something uh, totally different. It clearly didn't work because as I said, they, they rectified that almost immediately with the next film, but as sort of a, one-off standalone film and not that it's necessarily a standalone film but the fact that they were willing to try something different again it's like with halloween 3 in that in that era trying to go in a different direction with these with these franchises i'm always going to respect that and again it's it's a again i think certainly my my love for halloween ends really enhances and sort of brings us all full circle. So I, I'm definitely a big fan of this film. It's a, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but to me, I think it's a worthy, it's worthy enough of being in, uh, in this position for, for me, because it's, uh, you know, it's not quite top five, but it's, it's, it's pretty darn close. And again, I like it when these films are unafraid and willing to take those big risks. And instead of just saying, all right, we'll just give you the same thing again. This was all right. We're gonna try something a little different now. Well, before I get to to my next one, I'll go ahead and say this now because we've talked about all of yeah. the films that this pet theory of mine relates to. <clears throat> just follow me on this, if you will, for a minute, Phil. Yeah. The Jason that we get in part six, seven, and eight, it's not Jason Voorhees. It's the resurrected Roy. And let me play that out for you for a minute. Think about Jason in the first three films that we get him in and the way he kills people and the way he goes about things. And then think about the way Roy off people in part five and think about the way Jason in six, seven and eight off people. It's all creative. It's using power tools. It's ultra violent. There's a mean, nasty edge to it. That's a little different. I tried to lay this on Ron. He didn't buy it and there's no proof to it. This is my, again, my own pet theory, but I, I kind of like in my own head to play that. Well, what we're really seeing in six, seven and eight is Roy. It's the revenge of Roy three different times, because I feel like that if, if nothing more, what the producers took from that is like, well, we don't want to not do Jason maybe anymore, but we got to do that because people responded to the ultra violent killing that he got into in the creative kills. But I'm always kind of in my head thought, eh, six, seven and eight are just Roy. You know, that is actually a very interesting theory, which I, I have not thought about until this point. And I, I kind of like that. I kind of fun. I, I, you know, yeah, it, it actually makes you see those later entries in a different light. Yeah, I, I, I I'll buy into that absolutely. Again, it it, it mm -hmm. further justifies the existence of Part Five. So yeah, I'm all, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. No, again, it and it's if you like it, it savors the climax of Part Four. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'll buy that. I'll buy that every day of the week and twice on Sunday. All right. Well, good. I finally got one buyer. On That's that. all right. Hey, you know, it's a one, one person at a time, Jay, one person at a That's time. It. Just, just one, one, when you get one convert at a time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, my fifth entry is Friday the 13th, 2009, the remake, the, okay. the last one that we, we got. Um, and what's funny to me about this one, Phil, is I went through a real evolution with this film. I saw it in theaters when it came out. You know, was real jazzed about it and, and really want to see it. And I walked out of the theater pissed because <laughs> I felt like, oh, God, this is just just a mishmash of a bunch of mess and da, 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 da. And I think I wrote a blog about it and whatever. <laughs> and some years later, when we got around to reviewing it, it maybe been seven or eight years later, we got around to reviewing it. I realized and maybe it was the fact that I didn't at the time when I went and saw this, I hadn't seen a Friday the 13th movie in a while and I didn't have access to them. I think I had a couple of VHS at that point. So I didn't really rewatch anything. I just went into it. 
and when I watched it again, um, and I'd seen it a few times, you know, just here and there, but when I watched it again to you know think about it was when we were doing all those reviews. And so I'd seen every Friday movie, you know, in the six or seven weeks prior and watching it again, I'm like, no, you know what? This is brilliant. This is a, Hey, we're going to remake it. And we're not just going to shot for shot it <clears throat> cough, cough, nightmare on the street remake. And we're not going to try to do that again. Uh, and, and we're not going to try to do Rob Zombie and go bonkers, you know, Halloween 20, you know, 07, which has its moments. I agree, but we're not going to do that. We're going to give you the greatest hits by the, the bands you love. And I've always equated this to, you know, Steve Perry hadn't been in journey a long time, but that little Filipino guy that they got singing <laughs> sounds a whole lot like him. And if you just go for the, for the jam and you go for the music, you're going to get what you want out of it. And this movie is an encapsulation of all of the best things that a Jason only story could be. And I really give Shannon and Swift, the screenwriters, the credit to how can we shove eight movies worth of stuff, maybe nine movies worth of stuff into one movie at once without getting off into spiritual moments and we're jumping bodies and how can we populate it with people from CW shows that you love to hate, you know? So (laughs) everybody's got, got something in this movie and they do a great job of telling the backstory. I mean, this, the epilogue, not the epilogue, the prologue to this movie is long. It takes Mm. 20 minutes before we get the title screen. And I used to think like, gosh, that's what is going on. I'm like, no, I love this because instead of doing previously in Friday the 13th, they just show it to you and i i got into all of it i got into the idea of digging tunnels and jason putting pot out there to try to lure the kids because why not you know every predator lures the prey he shoots not matthew mcconaughey with an arrow it's a hell of a shot eat your heart out katniss everdeen i mean i there's there's so much about this one that i that i like and it's got all the trappings of a friday the 13th movie you got the gorgeous girls they're there obviously to be you know slaughtered you got the douchebag boyfriends that you just want to die you got the friends you don't want to die and it swerves you too because i thought daniel panabaker was going to be alive at the end and nope <laughs> and she gets it pretty violently too and the fact that they they bring it down to just Jared Padalecki and Amanda Rigetti on that dock, and then here comes Derek Mears does not get the credit he deserves. I, I I love Kane Hodder; he is the embodiment of Jason. But there was a franchise to be built around this dude, and it just didn't happen. And this movie made a ton of money. I don't know why they never got another one out of it. But I have come to really really like this one. So Friday the Thirteenth, two thousand nine, is in my five spot. Well, I will second that, Jay, because it is number five for me as well. And I will co-sign that. This is this is how you do a remake of a classic horror film. Yes. You, you don't reinvent the wheel like they tried to do with Halloween. You don't copy and paste like they did with uh, with Nightmare. This is the template. It It, it is... I know it's an overused term, but it's a love letter to the original entries in the series. It manages to present all that you know and love about Jason while also updating the mythology in a way. I thought the tunnel inclusion was a brilliant stroke with the little bells and the trip wires. All of that, again... It wasn't necessary. Like you could have taken it out of the movie and the movie still would have been fine, but it was a nice way of explaining how, again, in those early films, how does Jason get from point A to point B? That was just a clever nod. And I'm with you. This was a, this probably is the biggest wasted opportunity of the entire Friday, the 13th series, because you could have done a part two, you could have done a part three from this one film. There was enough material here. And and again, you could have gone off, you know, in into crazy directions with it. I mean, like I said, they they really kept it in line. It doesn't go into the sort of spooky, uh, is this a ghost? Like it was very none of the more cerebral aspects that certainly came in in later entries with the series this is if you love those original 
pretty much one through five, I guess I would really say. Uh, it, it really does capture that spirit. It it, it works so well. And I, I, again, I don't know why. Again, I'm sure it was probably legal issues and lawsuits that have been involved with this series from pretty much the, the beginning. But this this is it. I mean, I I loved it the first time I saw it. I I rewatch it every year during uh during spooky season. I mean, this one will actually take precedent sometimes over watching the original one and two because it's just such a it's such a a good hybrid of those early entries, and you get all of the necessary ingredients, but it it doesn't beat you over the head with it. Like again, I sort of go off of the Halloween uh, example where they sort of painstakingly tried to show you this is why Michael is who he is, and that's just wrong. You just don't do that, I think. Uh, again, even like with the mask, there was too much emphasis on that, whereas this was like, we're going to give you the the hits. I mean, you said it perfectly. We're going to give you the hits, and then we're moving on because that's what a Friday the 13th movie is. It's a lean, mean machine. Well, and that's the thing. is, It's a 97-minute movie. Yeah, I mean it blows it, by, uh, yeah. and that kills me. It, it blows my mind every time I watch it to go like, this is only a little over an hour and a half long. Like with credits, it's basically an hour and a half. Yeah, I'm like that is you said it. It's the template for how these things should be done, and that is never picked up on it again. You know? Yeah, waste wasted opportunity. Totally Maybe. wasted opportunity. But I'm glad we both liked that one. Because like I said, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, this is wrong. And then I, maybe it was just years of watching bad horror remakes too. But <laughs> well, that'll do it to you, I believe. <laughs> that, that will. But I think it's also, I I went into it not, not in the proper mindset to go, oh, I'm here to watch a remake. Because this is when that phenomenon was just, I mean, we had done a slew of them in the post screen world where like everything got you a house of wax and, you know, black Christmas and all those. And those are kitschy and fun. Sometimes they're also sometimes awful, you know, and I'd seen all of that at that point. So I thought, eh, yeah, maybe it won't be that. And it wasn't that. And I, I just wasn't ready to accept what it was. And then it was again, watching it years later, I'm like, no, this is smart. It's yeah. deft. It's, it doesn't waste any time. It knows exactly what it's supposed to be. It's an ACDC song. You know, it <laughs> knows what it's supposed to be. That's right. That's right. And it's just going to be that. And it, and I, I appreciate that for it. So no, I, I'm glad we both liked that one and, and give it its due. Cause I think it, it definitely deserves it. Yeah, I think it's definitely come along in recent years because, again, certainly I think you know for more perhaps diehard fans of the franchise, it's it, it definitely probably took a little bit to find that uh, to find its audience. But I mean, like like any good film, uh, it, it, time has a way of healing all wounds. Indeed, it does. Indeed, it does. So we're up to my number four spot now. Uh, all righty. And- it's the original. It's the OG. It's Friday oh, wow. the Thirteenth, and I. This is the only one of these franchises where I would ever have the first one this low on the list. Um, I, I'll say that now. Usually, that's the pinnacle, and everything else you know streams from. But it really was just the idea, and I think what I like about it is that it's the one non-Jason one that I know I will go back and watch. Um, it again lends a lot into the old boy scout days in me so i feel a lot of kinship (laughs) with the way it's put together and some of the people in it and i see some of the old uh, camp counselors that i would run across in summer camp were similar to some of these folks not entirely but kind of especially steve christie i think i met that person in a lot of places (laughs) through the years and i probably met mrs Voorhees along the way too though not not crazy but no that that type of person there's one Um, in every town yeah there always is but but i i just remember that and um it's also because it's a movie that is so simple it's it's built off of the man that halloween thing was awesome let's just go do that in the woods yeah, I mean that that was it. Yeah. I mean that is the That's whole it. thing, and it was it was five hundred grand, you know, it, and they spent a lot of that on the score, and it's Tom Savini really working out a lot of trauma for Vietnam for himself and doing the makeup effects that he got for it, and it's a it's a young cast of people, a few of which you see down the road, one of which you still see all the time, Kevin Bacon, one of our <laughs> finest actors, you know, and you just get you just can get lost in it and. I can at least, and I have fun with it. And I have fun with the James Bond villain way that Mrs. Voorhees decides to explain to Alice 
here's why I did what I did. Here's why it is. They they were making love while he drowned, and she's so melodramatic. You know, Betsy Palmer's so over the top about it. And I there's just something fun about it. And I love the fact that her and Alice beat the absolute shit out of each other for like 10 minutes. I, I mean, they really do. It's a great fight. And there may be nothing in my early life as just impressed upon my brain as the machete swing when Mrs. Voorhees is decapitated at the end of it. And I know it's going the wrong way and all that stuff, whatever. But this, the, the fact that her hands are like gripping, it, it calls back to the way uh, James Earl Jones's character goes down in Conan the Barbarian a little bit uh, with some of that. But there's a lot of that. And I... And it, by the time I saw the original Friday the 13th, I had seen Conan. So I'd seen a good decapitation or two in my day. And I thought, this is, this is just cool. And so I, there's something about this one that's just fun. And if you just want to watch a Friday the 13th movie, but you don't want to get in the lore of all the things, well, you can just watch this you know, it's like the a band you like. It's their first album that didn't hit. It's back when we let bands have more albums to finally find themselves. But it's one you like. You know, it's like, well, there's still good songs on it. You know, so I I, I liken it to something like, you know, if you like a band like Def Leppard, it's it's high and dry or on through the night. It's an early early twist before they got into you know the stuff that made them famous. And and I I don't know. I, I just I just like it. So I've got Friday the Thirteenth, the original is my number four. I'll I'll save my thoughts uh for a little bit, but no, I I I like I like what you're saying there. It it is it is the most straightforward entry in the series. And uh again, it's it is certainly like if you're gonna start with, with one, you might as well go to one. It really it's it's it is the basis, of course, by which the entire series uh still exists. So again, we have to tip our hat to that. Uh, number four for me is actually part four, the uh, the final chapter. This is, uh, again, the one that was meant to finally end it. Again, it's in the title, of course. You know, that was back when you thought maybe that, you know, titles meant something, but of course that isn't necessarily the case. Uh, again, I'm looking at you, Halloween Ends, and I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, you, you don't end these particular series. And uh, they tried, though. I have to give them, they, uh, they tried to end Jason. He goes down... Uh, in a splatterific way in this particular one with a machete to the head and to the neck. It's, it's a gruesome end for his character. The mask comes off. It's, it's quite a, quite a, quite a great way to end it. But yeah, th this one, I have such a, I have such a, a soft spot for it because this is the one, of course, that introduces Tommy Jarvis. And up until this point, there was no, sort of mortal enemy, if you will, for for Jason. Uh, that is one thing that, again, I always point to that Halloween has over all of these, uh, these 80s franchises. They had Laurie and they had Dr. Loomis. And Friday, you had Alice from the first film. She carries over into the first 10 minutes of the second film. Then she gets it uh Ginny who's in the second film she doesn't make it or I shouldn't say she doesn't make it but they uh went on without her character uh or I guess she didn't want to do it that's more the the story behind it so there was not a lot of consistency with characters carrying over so it was always a bunch of sort of faceless uh, victims in some cases but uh this is the one where we get we get a we get Tommy and He's played by young Corey Feldman in this uh, particular film. And what I like about it is it sort of goes against the traditional uh, rules of these films. Uh, Tommy is you know, essentially like a 10 or 12 year old boy who's into horror movies, all of that kind of uh, Fangoria, uh, you know, graphic splatter film stuff. And so it kind of makes him an interesting foil for Jason. And I like that in this particular movie, it's not the the usual final girl who's uh, taking down Jason. It is, in fact, this kid who, who stands up to him. And he, he takes him on in kind of a very creepy and unsettling way where he essentially tries to make himself look like a young Jason Voorhees. And again, there was a lot of ideas, I think, going on in this film where they were, you know, maybe thinking about the future, about, you know, maybe, you know, uh, Tommy would become the, you know, the next uh, Jason or whatnot. Uh, but just sort of looking 
at this film as it is. Uh, it's a it's really a, a suspenseful one. I remember the first time I watched it, uh, just the whole vibe of them being in their cabin in the woods and Jason stalking around and then the mom gets it. Like it, it really, it doesn't pull any punches. And that final shot of the film, which, you know, the previous two entries had sort of ended with, uh, you know, with Jason uh, either lying dead or, or you know, maybe you know, slightly twitching uh, before the film cuts to credits. This is the one that ends with Tommy, and it's after he's killed Jason, and so he's he's looking a little demonic, maybe even possessed or or whatnot. And it's it's one of the most unsettling endings in this entire franchise. And I remember thinking to myself, God, that's really creepy, because again, it's it, it's the idea that maybe innocence has been corrupted or or tainted by evil, but. Uh, you know, insofar as you know, this film was concerned, I thought it was a unique way to go in kind of sort of reinventing the wheel in a way with we're gonna we're gonna you know make Jason's main antagonist, if you will, this kid essentially. And I and again, I thought that was a clever way to go about it in, in a way that never felt necessarily forced or just trying to be, oh, we'll be provocative and make it as a kid. And I, I, I respect that. Again, whenever these types of franchises can take bold swings and sort of shake it up a little bit, I'm always going to be in favor of it. So, yeah, uh, part four you know, originally was supposed to be the ending for Jason. Of course, we know how that turned out. But, uh, you know, certainly, you know, if you look at it as a one through four entry, I mean, this is a pretty damn good way to to close out the series. Well, I'm going to save my thoughts on part four because it's a little higher up the list for me. All right. I, I agree with a lot of what you said, and we'll add to it as we get there. Fair enough. Fair enough, Jay. Number three for me is the first one I saw in theaters with my grandmother. <laughs> Friday the 13th, part six, Jason lives. <laughs> I've, I've, I've told the story on Film Strip a couple of times. My grandmother was really into like Hitchcock films and all of that kind of stuff. And so I grew up watching those with her and, you know, stuff like when a stranger calls, even I think I saw with her, it was on cable. And so she, you know, knew I had seen a few of these movies and said, let's go see that. So I was like, okay. So we went to a matinee one Saturday and saw it. And it was one that, again, I was, I was a young scout at this point. I, I don't think I was even in full boy scouts at this point, but I knew the whole, you know, all the, the lore of it. So it spoke to that. And through the years, it's just become one that not only was it a you know, course correction for them as, as, to put my pet theory aside of like, no, let's get this back to where it needs to be. Let's strip it down. Let's make it simple. Uh, but it's got a cast that is absolutely lovable. Um, all of them are. The kids are lovable in it. Tommy is great in it. Megan is the, the you know, the sheriff's daughter, who's, of course, the only thing wilder than a sheriff's daughter is a preacher's kid, you know, in a, in a horror movie. <laughs> and so she's wild as hell. She's driving that Camaro. My brother had a kind of a sports car like that at the time. So, it, you know, I, I got to that. I loved her dad. I felt like he he looked like. I don't know, four or five other people. I always thought he kind of looked a little Donald Sutherland, like poor man Donald Sutherland from the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, he had that curly hair and all that. But I, I liked all the people in it. I especially liked the, the character named Court Andrews, who's like the punk rocker kid or whatever with the sleeves. And he gets these kids together and the line of bullshit he lays on them about like Native American culture and how it goes is hilarious because it does remind me of a lot of the scout the older scouts that would get us together and the stuff they would tell us. And you realize like, they're just making this shit up as they go. Like, Oh man, you guys don't know anything, man. These guys used to pack up these rocks. And, so, and I just responded to it. I thought it was fun. The, the opening where Jason comes across and slashes the screen, like he's frigging James Bond. I mean, that spoke to me. I was a bond ad at that point. Everything about it is, is fun. Now it's goofy and it's kind of stupid in, in a lot of ways, but it is a, a movie that, understands hey we're all here to have fun it's 86 minutes which means it's about 80 minutes a movie it doesn't waste any time we turn jason into frankenstein's monster you know in the opening sequence and i loved all of that i thought yeah that makes total sense at this point and it's just a it's just a fun fun movie and then that alice cooper song with the video that went with it, this was when MTV was just taking over everybody's life. You know, 
I just thought, man, this is this was a movie that was made for 1986. <laughs> I mean, it really <laughs> was. And it just feels like 1986 in a movie. And there's just something comforting and fun and warm and easy about watching it that makes it go down so simple for me. So I, I put it in my three spot, man. Maybe it's a little nostalgia uh, for me, and I'll admit that, and a personal spot. But I, I always have a good time with this one in every spooky season. I make it a point to make sure I get to swing through this this part of, of a forest green, as it were, because uh, they try to change the name, but it's still the same old Jason. I, I respect that. There's n- nothing wrong with having a little soft spot for nostalgia, so I I, I get it. Absolutely get it. Um, all right, so number three for me is actually part three. Uh, I would have loved to have seen this film in 3D. It's kind of a wild uh, trip to watch it now because the film even though it's not in uh, that format the shots are still as if it is uh, you know meant for 3d I sort of think of a film like Jaws 3 is another example but this is a I, I think a, a much tighter uh, story and that's obviously saying something when you're you know dealing with Jaws 3 um, but that's for another discussion this is one where, of course, Jason gets the iconic mask. This is the one that that sort of cements him as this enduring slasher figure of, of the 80s. And frankly, to today, it's sort of interesting. People think Jason always had the mask. He didn't. This is the movie that introduced it. And it's it's done in a very sort of you know, innocent way. It's you know, because I was very curious because, again, I saw these films largely out of order and so i kind of was figuring all right so how does he get the mask how is this going to happen there's going to be some kind of a big payoff and there really isn't it just sort of happens and he puts the mask on um again i'm sure they never thought at the time that, that it would take on the uh you know the iconic status that it did but uh as far as the film itself it, it's such a it's such a wild ride because you're right you said it jay there's a an interesting soap opera element to it uh, that just sort of exists almost out of thin air. Uh, even though it gets a little cheesy, I have to say Chris is probably one of the best final girls in the Friday series. And like I said, she really takes it to Jason. I mean, just that scene at the end with the ax to the head. I mean, it it, it doesn't get much better than that in a in a horror movie I, I love the scene when she tries to hang him with the rope and she thinks she's you know she's got him and then of course you know he manages to you know get himself uh free of of the knot it, it's a it's a wild movie there's a lot of sort of just you you know kind of unique and very 80s centric uh, characters i mean shelly is a is a lovable goof and again it's it's sort of ironic that he's the one that's responsible for uh you know the mask coming into jason's uh uh, uh collection but e- even the element of the of the biker gang which I, like when you sort of step back and like okay why is why is this happening like they, i almost feel like they had to probably pad the run time a little bit but even that it, it just sort of works with the whole just sort of over the top element of this film it is a very 80s horror movie that is evident by the fact that they shot it in 3d which was sort of like a revived gimmick during that time again i mentioned jaws 3 as an example but i don't know i I just have a a soft spot for this one as i do with the original uh you know three kind of viewing it in a a trilogy if you will not that it's necessarily a a straightforward one but it's it's one of those movies where I love the the grainy, low budget quality that you find in the previous two. I like that sort of Jason becomes the Jason that we largely associate with in the rest of the series, though he's still, I would say, much more human, if you will, than kind of you know hulking monster, whatever you know, maybe Roy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, revived or something. But no, I there's a lot to enjoy with this film and again you said it this could have been it like if they had stopped after part three it is very satisfying because like you said it it, it ends in such a way where you're, you're you're either okay it's over or 
is it over? Again, there's a lot of the great framing in these early films I appreciate from a filmmaking standpoint, because even though they are extremely low budget, and certainly this film had more money uh, in its budget than even the, uh, the previous two, there's always a special deference to try to frame the camera in a way that images stay in your mind, like whether it's just a shot of the stillness of the lake or sort of a background view of the trees. There's a lot of that that just sort of feels very Friday the 13th to me. And when I look at this film along with the other two, there's an iconography that I don't know is always there with the other films. I would actually say the remake to me felt like it kind of did its best to capture that iconography again and sort of bring it back to to basics but i mean it's one of those things if you if you want to go for you know the the original hits i mean just go to where it all started and yeah th this is one where yeah it's a little it's a little hokey at points but you know I, I, again much like with some of the other entries this stays in my mind for just sort of the creepiness and the again truly slasher villain aspect of Jason. I really felt like it, this was a big upgrade from part two where he was a little kind of, you know, dopey at points and easily getting knocked down. Whereas this is, this is the Jason that I think we all know and associate with the series. And again, even the, you know, the outfit, you know, he's got the dream, uh, the green coat on. And again, it's very, very clean and straight uh, forward and to the point. And, I, I just have a good time with this film. It's one of those movies where if I'm uh, ever trying to, you know, just sort of, you know, have it on in the background or even, you know, at a Halloween party, like this is one that I will put on just as sort of like a you know, fun you know, background discussion, because there's a lot, there's a lot to love with this film. And, and there's definitely, you know, some nostalgia, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, for part three, uh, it, it, it's, it's a worthy, uh, worthy of being in the top trio for me, I have to say. I can certainly respect that. I mean, again, I, I have it in the top five and I consider all of those to be more or less the essential, you yeah. know, uh, Friday the 13th ones, I, I would say. And yeah, you, you've said a lot, a lot of it said it great, Phil. I mean, I agree with it. It, it is iconic in a lot of ways and I'm with you. I really wish I could have seen it in 3d. I don't know if the new remaster like home 3d version, how that looks or works, but I don't think it would have been the same as seeing it in a theater in 3d. And I did see the other movie that was out around that same time in 3d. And that was of course, jaws 3d in the theaters. And uh, <laughs> you, know, you ever want to talk that I have thoughts, oh. <laughs> so, so, but uh, yeah, I'll mark that down. Jack. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess I'm up to number two uh, now. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, it'll spoil the ending, but uh, <laughs> part two is my number two. And it's because it's the first one I ever saw. Um, I caught it because we had family friends that uh, the gentleman at the time had the, the, at the time, the four of them um, on VHS and they were sitting right in his like cabinet in his uh, living room and his uh, youngest daughter uh, babysat me a couple of times. And, um, you know, I was a kid and she was like, Hey, let's watch these. This will be fun. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> Cause she knew I had seen like scary. She was like, what have you seen? And I was like, I've seen shining. I've seen Halloween. She's like, Oh yeah, you're good. And so we, we watched this and it just, I just had a great time with it because it does something that, can come off hackneyed if it's done wrong but it does it so well and is that you didn't need to see the first one for you to be able to watch this movie and get into it and it was because it was before vhs was a thing so how do we get everybody up to speed without reshowing the other movie completely right well let's give them just enough of it and then we'll get into a new story and i think it has some of the best characters in terms of camp people ever and it gives you a great swerve because there's this huge cast so as a horror movie fan i'm like man the slaughter is going to be epic and it's only about five or six people to get killed because half of them go to town <laughs> like, <laughs> and decide to stay out this is the best decision they ever made was to go to the second bar and i i just found that to be funny it's uh, because it is life it's one of those funny asides I'm like oh gosh you know who knows what would happen but I, I love the way jason stalks people in this movie um i love the 
again some of the kills in this the the gentleman that's in the wheelchair and he comes up from behind oh. that machete and then the way that is going down those steep steps it's a great shot and it's just one of those like they had to do that one time you know they got <laughs> one shot at that and it worked great with the the, the mannequin and all uh, but you i mean you have you have a good group of folks to have fun with um you also pick back up on you know you survive a horror movie you don't make it i'm as mad as anybody else rachel Carruthers got done the way she did in halloween five i felt like she deserved a little bit more of a death but the archetype for it is alice here and poor adrian king had been stalked in real life and was like i don't want anything to do with any of this but i will come back and do it if you'll just kill me off and they're like oh yeah sure no problem and so it it opens up the whole world of like how did jason find her where is she what is happening it and it doesn't bother to explain any of it and that to me is half the fun it's like oh i i don't i don't know that that makes it kind of the the fun part i mean i feel like as a gen x or you we're the world's last reporters because we were the last people that had to learn how to ask good questions to get information it wasn't at our fingertips all the time and so you had to learn how to dig through and find stuff and this movie invites you to ask a lot of those questions and then sort of make it up in your own mind as to where it went, where did it go? And how did that happen? And where did he come from? And what happened to itsy bitsy spider girl? You know, is that Tina as a young girl? I mean, who knows? You know, you can, you can spend forever on it, but ultimately it's a lean and mean movie. It goes down easy and it's just a lot of fun. And it's a, I mean, I love the mind games that Jenny, Amy Steele plays on Jason in this the fact that she puts on the garb and becomes mother and, you know, psychs him out more or less so she can hit him, you know, and get out of there. And then he comes through that window at the uh, end. That's just, and you wake up and you're like, where's Paul? Who's Paul? What? You don't know what happened. And that's, again, it's the, it builds this great mystery and just leaves you hanging, you know, where the first one had the jump scare at the end with the, the you know, Jason coming out of the water and all that. Um, this one I think had a better version of that. I, I really liked it. And I know it's, it's funny to say that because it was all they had left for, they had no money and they had to come up with something. And so they said, we'll just do that and just cut to white and we won't explain it. And I'm like, well, it's actually an artistic genius moment, you know, that often is born out of necessity. And I feel like it was in this one. So uh, Friday the 13th part two is my, uh, my number two in the series. All right. Well, I will, I will hold my thoughts uh, a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Okay. Are we giving it away now, folks? Um, number two for me is part one, uh, Friday the 13th, the original entry, the film that started this entire saga, if you will, uh, very much inspired. Some might even say a rip off of Halloween. Uh, I would probably say more of a rip off. Uh, it's just, you know, it's Halloween in the woods without uh, the, you know, the, the, the trappings of John Carpenter, Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasance, et cetera. But for what would become an archetype of these type of subgenre of, of horror films in the 1980s, this is really the, the, the template because while it is certainly inspired, uh, some may say to a fault by Halloween, it does create its own rules in a way that a lot of other horror films followed to, I would say pretty at some points, bad uh, degrees Friday, as I've said from the start, it doesn't try to pretend it doesn't try to be something that it's not. And that is very clear in this film for as much as I sort of knock the, the, the horror, you know, like the Halloween uh, ripoffs. This is a very straightforward, bare bones story. You, you get, you know, at points, thinly sketched characters but that's that's the whole point of this it's not you're not meant to sort of fall in love with these characters like you you would have with uh, Lori and annie and linda and halloween basically these characters are there to be fodder for the unseen killer which again when i first saw this film again sort of not having any frame of reference about just sort of oh jason is this iconic figure I kept waiting for him to show up in the hockey mask. And of course, Jason does not show up in this film in his usual form. He does make that surprise twist at the end that you alluded to um, earlier, Jay, but it, it's uh, it's the mom. It, it I, Talk about a great twist. And I think that's what really 
sells me on this film you know because i it, there are you know questionable story beats and some of the characters are, like i said it's very it's very bare bones um there are some unique personalities like you know the mr christie type and uh you know even uh you know the the the, the town crank i think ralph his name is like we've all known people like that or we've certainly encountered them in our lives i i grew up in a small town so i i know some of these people you know yep. you know so like it's it is a real uh character caricature these are not just you know, you know big bits of people's imaginations but um no all of that is there but to me what really sells it is the fact that it's it's his mom it's mrs Voorhees. she's the killer what a great twist and talk about sort of being a pioneer if you will i mean it's a it's a it's a female killer that was not the norm in uh what was this 1980 or 1981 when this film came out which i mean now it would almost probably border on a cliche but you know to have the you know the grieving mom or the angry parent but this was this was fresh ground to uh to explore in this film and they do it in such a way where i think with any other actor actress it probably would have been truly over the top there's a there's a very fine line that, that that betsy palmer walks in this film where again she is melodramatic like i said the way she's going on about you know they were making love while he drowned and just like she, she's just sort of erratic it's you know you can see kind of where uh you know laurie metcalf you know took uh took notes for uh for scream too probably yes. but it's <laughs> um it, she she sells it like i said she sells the fact that she is this grieving mother and it again it's even though she's been behind all these horrible uh, murders in the film, like you do feel in a, in a way, a strange sense of sympathy for her, which is again, bizarre when you look at the fact that this is a horror film and you, you know, never associate that with, with Michael or, or Jason or anybody else, but you sort of look at it in a way like this is, this is a really sad, pathetic person who's just angry because her kid died over negligence at a camp and it, it actually kind of makes the story much more grounded in a way that kind of sort of puts aside a lot of the over the top and and sometimes spectacular elements where there is actually kind of a unique and, and very, very personal story at the core of all of the blood and the guts. And I think that sometimes gets overlooked because people just sort of view them as, oh, this is just a another slasher film. But there there is a very... Uh, important psychological underpinning that really holds this film together that none of the other entries really tap into as much. I think this one really, there's something going on with Mrs. Voorhees. And again, I think that's probably the basis for why they want to do a TV show because there's a lot of ground there. And that's a, again, a testament to, uh, to Palmer's performance that she gives you just enough, but there's enough to be asking questions like, what else is going on with this woman? Like it, it, this is more than just she lost her kid and she snapped. Like this, this is probably a backstory here that might explain all of this even more so. But yeah, it's it's an iconic film. It started the franchise, and as I mentioned earlier, the the iconography is very heavy in all three of these these uh, first uh, entries where. They just feel like a Friday the Thirteenth film, and again, what what better way to say that than right here with the first entry? No, I I love the fact that we both have this in our top end of things, and for a lot of the same reasons. And I'd like to just let people know, this is why you cast real actors to yep. take some of these roles sometimes, because Betsy Palmer was an actor. She was on stage, you know, and she did it for the paycheck. She'll straight tell you, told you that to the day she died and she never shied away from it. And she said, you know, and nobody ever blamed her for it. Cause heck yeah, you know, good. I'm glad you got a good car out of it, Bets. But she, she took it and said, okay, so this is my role. Cool. Well, I'm going to give it a thing then. You know, I don't understand it. Maybe I don't get it. And it doesn't matter. I'm going to give this my all because I'm a crafts person i i understand the craft of acting and she gives it so it's the same thing donald pleasance gives Thank dr y'all. loomis and and in any of the performance particularly those first two halloween movies that character has no business being as interesting as it no. is 
but he gave it a total lift because you've got freaking Blofeld you know, to, to play <laughs> to play Van Helsing. I mean, yeah. that's the way he read it. And John Carpenter's smart enough to go like, man, go with it. I hired you to act, you know? And so, and, you know, again, Sean Cunningham hired Betsy Palmer to you act, you know, yeah. I go do. And there's something to be said for that too. I mean, I, I find it fun today when you get like these serious actors, you know, and things like that, that'll do a horror movie and people act surprised that they're good at it. I'm like, well, yeah, they're actors, exactly. you know, <laughs> like they're really good. <laughs> like Nupita Duongo rules in horror movies because she's a great actor, you know? <laughs> and so. Shouldn't I, shock anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, again, at the time, that wasn't something we would have expected. So I, yeah, I'm glad we both, both loved that one uh, for a lot of the same reasons. That's, that's an awesome treatise on it. And it's definitely, I mean, it's it's not only horror homework; it's like required, you know, yeah. pre-syllabus before you get in the class. You gotta, you gotta, gotta watch Friday. One. Yeah, no, you, you gotta, gotta know. know. Yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, and just think, it might have changed Casey Becker's life forever as she paid. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's a good point. <laughs> but oh well, I know that's right. We're paying attention, Casey. We're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're we're up to my number one. I mean, it's obvious what's left if you've been playing along at home. It's Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter, Phil, and I want to tell you oh. why. Um, I have I'm curious used, about this one. I have used this as the way to get people into Friday the Thirteenth uh, okay. for years. Uh, good example: my buddy Brian had never seen a Friday the Thirteenth movie before. We were getting ready to do Freddy vs. Jason. He'd seen the Nightmare movies. He'd seen most of them at least, and so he and I doing those was kind of a series that was close to him. But he didn't know the Friday movies, and he said, "Should I watch some of the Friday the Thirteenth stuff before we do Freddy vs. Jason?" And I said. Watch final chapter. It's all you really need. And I said, you'll get the basic. I said, there's a lot more. I said, but if you watch that, you're going to get what Jason's all about. And Ron and I both asked him on and off the pod, like, okay, did you kind of get what Jason's about? He said, oh man, I went back and watched some more after that. He, and I was like, ah, see, they did their job. Now the, the final chapter bit was a cheat. Cause I don't think Paramount ever had any idea that they were not going to do it anymore. The, this was the original people behind it were done. Like they wanted to be done with this, but and so it had been like a lot of the same crew and stuff working on any, all these and Steve Miner had done two and three. He's a really great director in the genre, uh, but you know, he wanted done and everybody wanted to get off of this. And so the studio said, okay, cool. Here's a little bit of money. Here's, here's another thing. Let's get you a real director that can do stuff. And Joseph Zito made two of my favorite action movies of all time and of the eighties, Mission in Action and Invasion USA, both of which particularly Invasion USA have a lot more going on in them than it's just on the surface. And this movie is the same way. It's the last time that the cast is a group of people. We don't want to all die. We, we love these kids. We get to know who they are. We get to know the neighbors next door, Corey Feldman and his family, his mom, his sister. We get to know the kids that are coming in for the long weekend or whatever. And it's, I mean, it's a rogues gallery of folks. You've got Crispin Glover doing Crispin Glover things, you know, in this movie. And you, but you've got all the other folks too. You, everybody else in it is so much fun. And they, they give them, so many places to go, you know, and you get enough of everybody's story where you're rooting for them. You're like, I don't, I don't want Jason to get these people, but when he does, man, he goes to town on them and it it's we're throwing people through walls we're you know cutting people in half it's a great callback to the you know the second movie with the brother who's looking for his sister don't do the timeline in your head or make you nuts because it doesn't make sense but and he's got one of the i mean maybe maybe the meme worthy kill of all jason kills he's killing me he's killing me you know it's it's pretty much a narrate your own death situation <laughs> But really, it anchors on the fact that Corey Feldman gives a hell of performance in this. And I mean, it's it's easy to see why Spielberg was like that kid <laughs> right now. Like, that's why he wasn't around to do five kids, because he got one shot. They did one scene with him and he had to go back and do Goonies and other things. He gives a whale of a performance as Tommy Jarvis. And I'm with you. It gives Jason an arch enemy. It's like, ah, we have the Joker fully established. Now let's build Batman, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I love it. I, I love all everything about it. 
uh, it's again, it's so much fun. And if you look at it again, it's made for just a little over $2 million and it looks tremendous. The sets are great. They got Tom Savini back who did, I mean, he figured out what to do now <laughs> as he, he says in the first one, he was just making it up. Now he like really understood how to make it work and it looks amazing. And again, that last fight with Jason, he goes down hard. <laughs> I mean, it is a, we're going to put him dead in the, in the dirt. He is real dead. And um, RIP. Yeah, very much so at the end of this and to only have that end where, Tommy leans up and he's glaring at the camera. It's like, oh, oh, you know, they could have gone so many places. But the fact that they don't is fine. Again, I, I feel like if you want to, if I'm ever in the mood, like I want to watch a Friday the 13th movie, I'm such a completist that I'm like, oh gosh, do I have time to watch, you know, a string of these? And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put on Final Chapter because it sums up the initial treatise of Jason yeah. in one movie. And then if I want to jump into the other timeline, I can. But if I just want to get what I feel like is the quintessential entire shot of Friday the 13th, you get the great prologue that catches you up on everything you need to know up to that point. From one to three, you get all the flashbacks you need, all the setup. All, and, you know, timeline and continuity be darned. Who cares? You know, there's, <laughs> And I love this, this franchise for that. And it's just like, we're just, we're, we're into the ride now. And um, I, I mean, it's just, again, it's one of those, I just keep coming back to, and I'm like, man, it's, it's everything that you want in a Friday, the 13th movie from the eighties, uh, the best movie of all of them just being real is the first one. And then the 2009 remake, those are movies, you know, yeah. and, and in terms of like film and things like that, but in terms of just like, let's really, let's get our real greatest hits package, but maybe just let's get our historic, our hysteria album to use my Def Leppard, you know, analogy again, <laughs> this is the hysteria of the Friday the 13th series, all the hits, all the stuff, everything you want and nothing that you don't you know all, all through it and there's also some good easter eggy stuff kind of hidden in it the more you watch it the more it unravels the more you get to see that it's not just jason the tornado jason that was kane hodder necessarily in in the movies which was fun right but it's jason still being a big lunk stalker you know going around and just working his way through that camp and just eviscerating people and so final chapter is my number one I, I like that. I like that, Jay. I think that really, I, nothing further to add because you articulated it to a T. Uh, I definitely, uh, I, I feel like I have to go watch part four now. You really, you really, really, you really excited me up to, uh, to revisit that one again. So that's going to have to probably happen sooner rather than later. Uh, but that brings me to uh, my number one. And you probably could have guessed it by now, everybody, based on where we are. It is Friday the 13th, part two. And this is the one that I revisit the most. It is by no means the best entry in the series. It is arguably not even the best entry of the original four. Um, yeah, I'd have to really think about it where I would place it if I was just doing one through four. But it, it is one of those films where you said it perfectly you don't have to see part one to watch this movie and that doesn't always work with these types of you know, early 80s horror films like you know i think of halloween 2 i mean as much as i you know you know live and breathe that that series you really have to watch one to appreciate two uh and in some ways you really have to watch the original nightmare in order to appreciate too. Uh, again, screamed, uh, you know, go forth. A lot of times you have to watch the first to, to get caught up. And this film does all of that at the very beginning. You are brought up to speed, but this film is not contingent upon the events of part one. That's something that I think is really uh something to applaud and to take away because it just sort of says all right we're going to close the book on what you saw before 
and we're going to do an entirely different story. We're on a different side of the lake now. We're we're going to bring Jay. You thought he was a kid? No, we're going to make Jason some like big, maybe twenty something year old. Uh, you know, we don't really know what you know what his deal is. You know, is he? Uh, you know, is he? Uh, is he deformed? Is he? Is he not? Like we really don't know. We're not going to answer those questions. Like the movie does not care. For you sitting at home, you know, with your little notebook saying, well, wait a minute, how did this happen? What's going on? No, it doesn't care. And I like that. I like that it just says we are going to give you a straightforward 80 slasher film. It is going to be bloody. It is going to be gory. But it's also going to be suspense with it. It's not just a lot of cheap thrills and kills. There's actually some genuine moments of of terror in this film. And I think of the scenes involving Ginny, who is my favorite final girl of the Friday films. I think Amy Steele uh, was the best of, of all of them. I wish he would have come back for part three because I would have loved to have seen where this could have gone. It would have been a totally different film. I, and maybe Jason wouldn't be who Jason is today. So that's sort of a, a fascinating what if to consider. But for this film... Talk about a perfect uh, a perfect final girl to go up against Jason because not only is she tough and and resilient, but she's able to get inside his head. And this is of course before uh, Tommy Jarvis came along. And so the fact that she's you know, literally putting on his mother's sweater and, and pretending to be him, and, and she gets him to stop. Like it's it's very powerful, and it sort of shifts the dynamic of this film. I also like the fact that Jason is sort of hiding out in the, in the woods and sort of a dilapidated shack. There's something very creepy and ominous about that, especially when the, uh, the sheriff is chasing him through the woods. That's another great scene uh, that stands out with me. Uh, but you said it earlier, Jay, about how there's so many characters in this film. You think it's going to be a complete bloodbath and it's not. That's again, another one of the ways this film subverts your expectations in a way thinking, okay, you expect it to go this way. Well, we're going to pull the rug out. We're going to go another, you know, you think we're going to follow Alice from the first film. Nope. We're not, we're not going down the Halloween route again. Like I, I like how this film continues to sort of reinvent itself as it goes along. And, you know, I got to say, I, obviously I love the iconic hockey bask with Jason, but there is something deeply unsettling about the hooded Jason in the overalls, with the pitchfork, it really does play into the into the idea of this guy you know, being a, a spooky boogeyman character from from the woods. It really does fit with the ghost stories that they're telling around the campfire in this film, and and I like how there really is that more of an emphasis on the camp setting that we only kind of get in, get just a little tease with in the first film. This one really embraces the camp setting and and uses it i think to an even grander effect than the first one uh, and I, th this one it, it may not be perfect but i think in terms of cementing what this series would ultimately become it, it really ranks high for me it, to say nothing of of amy Steele's performance which again in a, in a in a series where there's not that many necessarily memorable final girls it's 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 a it's definitely a an applause worthy moment when you have one that not only can sort of be a stand out among the cast of characters but in this particular case goes toe to toe with jason and and manages to survive can't say that about alice <laughs> no that no. doesn't happen <laughs> nope i agree yeah. But no, yeah, for Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, that is that's number one for me. Uh, maybe controversial, maybe not be uh, uh, everybody's pick, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sticking with it. No, I like it. I like it. Feel that? I mean, again, it's my number two, so I'm right there with you. I mean, it's my silver medal, and for a lot of the same reasons. And I, since we both like the 2009 remake, I'm curious if you you agree with me on this. I think parts two and four inform that movie more than yeah. just about anything else. I think they took little bits from lots of stuff. But the the aesthetic of those two movies and the brutality of them in particular really informed the way that that Swift and Shannon and Marcus Nispel directed it, the way he made that movie. Yeah, the, the remake is two and four for a modern age. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I mean that in the best possible way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's, it's it's so good. But again, you know, we're, we're both big Halloween heads, you know, over here and stuff. But I want people to have heard like Friday the 13th is 
is a fun series. It is. It's yeah. an it's an easy series to jump in, have a it's, good time with. It's easier than Nightmare. Again, I, I didn't yeah. want to get off on the Freddy thing, but like, no, mm-hmm. it, it it is. It's a much easier film series to enter. And yeah, I mean, you said it's 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 sort of fun, and I mean this in the best way. It's sort of fun, dumb slasher. You know, yeah, like, it's, it, yeah. It's horror movies from an era when horror movies still somewhat protected the audience. And, and what you know, I mean by that yeah, is that I, I, yeah. Yeah, we don't try to delve into the deep psychology and make you go home and really question your own life and stuff like that. You know, it's just the we'll have a little bit of that, but we're really all here for the same thing. We're here, to, we're here for the drag race, man. We're here right. to have a good time. Yeah, and we're yeah. And by the drag race, I mean like the cars. You know, so we're here for the speed. We're here for the octane. We're here for the rock and there roll. No, let's not overthink this. And and I think that in the simplicity of it is its strength. It always was, and that's the you know for my beloved Halloween series, you know, oftentimes it decided to really try to ramp the serious button up, you know, to, to varying degrees of success. Oh, I, again, I, yeah. I'll be the first to say, you know, Halloween definitely takes itself very seriously, sometimes probably mm-hmm. to a fault. Um, but that like, that's, that's right there, arguably from the very first film, uh, mm-hmm. th- this film, th- these series, this series, it dabbles with it, but it, it never, goes full uh full, fully yeah. overboard and that's what i mean by when i say it it yeah. doesn't try to pretend to be something else it doesn't try to you know sort of get into like you know demonic whispers of like a freddy or or even the no. you know the, the the sort of the psychological you know disturbier of halloween like it, it just yeah. it's a it's a fun straightforward slasher film and you know whether the movie is like a you know an a plus or an, or not you still have a fun time with this series. Like it's, even the bad films are still enjoyable. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've used music analogies all night and I'll just end with one. You know, if Halloween is, uh, you know, Pink Floyd, that may be a little bit of a stretch, but, but let's go <laughs> with take, it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Which I love the Floyd, you know, it, it, but it's very serious. Got to yeah. get, you know, in the head sometimes. Sometimes you get a little weird and, you know, people hate each other, you know, <laughs> often <laughs> like the Floyd. Then Friday the 13th is ACDC. Yeah. You know, you, you know what you're going to get. They don't lie to you about what's coming and you're going to get all of it. And it's going to get a hundred miles an hour. And, and sometimes it works better than others. There's some of that. that's like, it, but boy, when it works, it works. And, and it's got iconic things about it. Like there's nobody in the world that doesn't hear the opening riff to hell's bells or back in black or thunderstruck and know exactly what they're doing. There's nobody that doesn't hear cow, 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 ma, 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 or see that hockey mask and know exactly what you're in the in line for. Uh, well, well said. I I couldn't have said any better, Jay. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, before we uh, before we close out of here, do you want to just run through your uh, your ranking again? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, Phil, this has been such a blast to to be a part of. Absolutely. So thank no, you, thank no. you for inviting me. Thank so, you. Number 11, I've got Jason Goes to Hell, Final Friday. Number 10, Jason X. Number 9, uh, Friday the 13th, Part 5, New Beginning. Uh, in the uh, number uh, 8 spot, I've got Friday the 13th, 7, uh, The New Blood. In the 6th spot, I've got Jason Takes Manhattan, Part 8. Uh, in the 5, or the 6th spot, rather, I've got, let me back up. In the 7th spot, I've got Jason Takes Manhattan, uh, Part 8. In the sixth spot i've got friday the 13th part three the five spot is the 2009 remake friday the 13th Uh, number four is friday the 13th the original number three is jason lives friday the 13th part six number two is friday the 13th part two and for me number one is friday the 13th the final chapter very solid very solid Mm -hmm. uh for me number 11 is the final friday Number 10 is The New Blood. Nine is Jason X. Eight is Jason Takes Manhattan. Seven is Jason Lives. Six is A New Beginning. Five, the remake, Friday the 13th. Number four is the final chapter. Number three is part three. Number two is the original, Friday the 13th. And number one, Friday the 13th, part two. So there you have it, everybody. We uh we ranked Friday the 13th in honor of this Friday the 13th, 2000 
24. Uh, Jay, before I let you go, again, give a plug for your show and where people can uh, stalk you in the best possible way online. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, Phil, this has been a blast. Thanks so much for having me on. You can hear me and my compadres over on the Filmstrip podcast. Just search that in any of your podcatchers. You'll find us. You can follow the show's social media at Filmstrip Pod everywhere. And my social media, I'm mostly on X and Instagram. It's Jay Ran here, uh, my name. So uh, when I'm not working or uh, reviewing movies with folks I'm, I'm out running somewhere so that's just <laughs> kind of my, my thing but yeah i uh, really enjoyed it phil thanks so much for having me here really love the work you do here and and always a, a, a weekly tune in for me here when you've got uh, got new shows oh, i appreciate that and likewise always enjoy your show and uh, again I, I encourage you to give them a like give them a listen subscribe because they they really do uh, Herculean work over there. Uh, you guys are always putting out fantastic content and, uh, and it's always a treat to see what you are going to review, whether it's a new film or uh, a, a trip down memory lanes. So I, I never know what to expect. And that's always something that I enjoy kind of, you know, the, the surprise, uh, the, the surprise for each new episode. So uh, definitely keep that up. And uh, again, uh, congratulations on 14 years. That is, Thank you. that is damn impressive, man. Absolutely. I, 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 I salute you for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. We, we are coming up on episode number 400. We've wow, already said this great. on a show, so I'll say it here too episode 400 for us will be the first show that comes out in 2025 we're mostly a bi-weekly release except for october when we do you know four in a row there or five on the right year but uh the first one in 2025 will be number 400 and that's going to be jurassic park so oddly enough, oh wow in okay. 400 you know 14 years we hadn't done a jurassic park film and we've got the whole gang that's remaining that's still podcasting doing that show phil it's me brian nick kurt Ron, Lindsay, Irina, and Nate are all going to be on the same oh, fantastic. show. Uh, my, my original co-host, Anna, has long since retired from podcasting, but um, <laughs> everybody else that's ever been on the show as a full-time you know, co-host is coming back for that one, which is going to be the most nightmarish hell to edit I've ever thought of. <laughs> um, maybe it'll be like chaos. It'll just completely devolve by the time it's <laughs> over. But uh, but no, yeah, we, we had fun with it. We, we kind of went in a round robin and, and had a little vote internally and narrowed it down and put it out there and the people spoke they wanted us to do Jurassic Park <laughs> so uh, we're going to do it so it's well, going to be a good time well that that is fantastic and I, I will certainly look forward to that uh, in the new year uh, to, to quote John Hammond you know, make sure you spare no expense uh, <laughs> indeed <laughs> we will we will be stretching the bandwidth that right. night I promise I bet, you so. I bet. <laughs> oh that, that'll be great um well, any event, Jay, be sure to have you back on uh, the show sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, first time uh, guests, so your your mugs and uh, you know, jackets will be in the mail. So you know, look for thank that you, sooner rather you. than later. <laughs> but uh, in in any event, everybody, of course, uh, thank you as always for tuning in or, or watching the show on YouTube. Again, this was a a, a longer one, but uh, we had a great discussion talking about this certainly interesting and and frankly beloved horror series and again any chance i can get to talk about a, a slasher film series i'm always going to take that up so jay thank you for being the inspiration on this one and uh uh helping it uh, come to uh come to fruition but on that note of course you can uh, follow along uh, all of my information is in the show notes and that will do it for us today on this Friday the 13th. Of course, I will be back next week and we will do this all over again for the love of movies.